Jin, please go on. Welcome, everyone. We live. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Pi and AI Kigali coming for the first time. My name is Nyangui Jean Dude, and I'll be the host today. I'm really glad that you joined us, and I hope that we will have a great event. So let's get started. Uh, once again, welcome. And so I, I will start uh, introducing the webcast team. So uh, I am with uh, Kennedy Wangali. Kennedy Wangali is uh, the planning.ai ambassador in Kenya, Nairobi. He's currently a data scientist at Safe Border, and he has been uh, a machine learning engineer at Omdena and data scientist at Confix AI. So you are with also Niteje Kajambie. Jambie is a professor at Integrated Polytechnic Region Center in EPLRC Tumba. So he's also doing master's degree in University of Rwanda. And so we are also with Kabanda Kreba. Kreba uh, is also AI enthusiast in Rwanda and he's joining Carnegie Mellon University. So I would really like to give thank you to all and, and honestly, it would not have been possible to launch this event without your support. So big thanks. Uh, I would also like to welcome our speakers. Uh, I will start for Odas Nateshman. Odas is founder and CTO of Insightiv. So uh, Insightiv is, uh, is a company working in, in medical Im imaging, uh, which is using AI. Uh, and so, uh, which is really great things here. So Odas uh, did also internship in Google in 2018. So it's really, it's really great to, to have you here in, in our event, Odas. Uh, we, all right. We are with also Desile Ivalo. Desile is, is machine learning practitioner. He's very active in the Kigali AI community and he's actively working on tech solution. So welcome, Desiree. Uh, thank you, Radio. Uh, we are with also David Place. David Place calling in from Serbia. Uh, David is data analyst at Three Lights. He was recently highlighted in top 100 AI influencers by AI Time Journal. And recently, uh, he has founded his, his, his new, new blog, which is Neurospike. Neurospike is making it easy to access important data science resource. So David, thank you for joining us and yeah, welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Wanyi, um, for inviting me. All right, thank you. So super excited to be with our speakers, and I hope that you like to hear what they have prepared for us today. So what are we going to see today? Uh, today, we get to see the message from deepplanning.ai team. Uh, and Andrew NJ from California. So very exciting to see their message. Also, we'll get to hear the talks from our speakers, the industry experts we have today. Also, we, as audience who attend this event, you get to access Coursera courses. And in the next events, you know, we will we'll keep having events. And hopefully we will have physical events when the situation will be really good enough that we can meet in person. It will be really exciting. Uh, that being said, I would like to, in, to talk a bit about Pi and AI events. 
Uh, Pi and AI yeah, are, are a series of deep learning.ai events all over the world. And today we have our page, we have Kigali page in the Pi and AI series. So these events are aimed at bringing beginners, intermediate and experts to learn AI together as the community. So now we have our page on the Pi and AI worldwide. Uh, let's now get to hear from Andrew NJ as he welcome us in the Pi and AI community. Hello, deep learners. I'm Andrew Ng, founder of deeplearning.ai, and I'm excited to welcome you to our global deep learning community. I know that many of you are here today because you want to break into AI and build your career. I hope that being part of this community will help you to do so. To give you a proper welcome, I'd like to show you around the deeplearning.ai offices and meet some of the teams so that you can see where it all happens. Oh, hi, Andrew. Um, do you want to tell our friends at Pine AI what you do at DeepLearning.ai? Sure. Hi, everyone. I, I make articles and other media that help people learn about AI and help them understand the huge impact that AI is having in the world. Today, I'm putting together the next issue of The Batch, our weekly newsletter, and I'm looking for the biggest stories of the week to keep our readers informed. What's been the most surprising thing you've run into working on The Batch? How much is going on in this field? There is never a dull moment. I, you know, you might think from the outside that machine learning engineers really understand everything about AI, but nobody understands everything about AI because this field is just coming to life right before my eyes as I put this thing together every week. All right, I know you're really busy, so I'll let you get back to it. Thanks, see you later. Let's go meet Kian, who helped me create the deep learning specialization. He's working on an exciting new project. Hey, Kian. So, do you want to tell the people at Pine AI what you're working on? Yes, sure. Um, I'm leading a project called Workera, uh, focusing on helping uh, people get offers uh, in AI and navigating their career by uh, testing their skills, uh, preparing for interviews and certifying them, as well as uh, matching and referring them to good jobs in AI. That's really cool. And what's the most exciting part of your day? You know, the AI field is new, uh, organizations and jobs are still misunderstood. So I'm excited to help people understand what different types of jobs exist in the field, uh, what tasks they will work on, and what skills are needed to achieve those tasks. Yep, and that's really important work. Well, it's nice chatting. And now let's go chat to Motel, who is on their product team. Do you want to say hi to our friends at Pine AI and let them know what you're working on? I would love to. Hi, everyone. I lead the product team in deeplearning.ai, where we create AI education content accessible to people all around the world. People like you. And what are you most excited about right now? I am so excited to see our community grow and to see how eager people are to learn more about AI. Thanks, also. Thanks, Andrew. So, as you can see, our team is working hard to support you and help you learn. It's never been easier than before to break into AI. So, if you want to build a career, you can leverage online resources available, including open source code, datasets, papers, and online courses like a deep learning specialization on Coursera. As part of this journey, I hope you get your hands dirty too. Don't be afraid of diving in to build your own project or go ahead and try to replicate a research paper that you're excited about. One thing that I've seen help a lot of people succeed is if you can build a community or find a community of fellow deep learners you can meet with and study with on a regular basis. In fact, I hope that this Pine AI meetup that you're at right now will be a good place for you to meet these people. 
I hope you enjoyed the event today and that you learn a lot both from the talks and from each other. And once again, welcome to the deeplearning.ai community. Uh, that was a great message uh, from Andrew NJ and the planning.ai team. So thank you, Andrew, for this community. Uh, let's keep our event. So we are now going to, to get to hear from our speakers. And we we'll start with Odas. Odas, welcome once again. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Oh, great. So, Odas, uh, in the brief, how do you define artificial intelligence with data science and machine learning? Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'll start with artificial intelligence. But uh, before I define AI, uh, I'm going to first uh, take a step back and uh, maybe get us to think about what we mean by intelligence. And uh, uh, one of the definitions that I found is the, the ability to acquire and apply skills, uh, but not just any skills, but uh, the skills that require knowledge and skills. So usually when you talk about an intelligent, uh, an, an intelligent human, be human being or intelligent person, it's a person who demonstrates that they, they have acquired, but they, have, they, have also, they are also able to apply uh, the, the skills. Uh, and really, uh, artificial intelligence as a field, uh, it's a branch of, of computer science that uh, tries to, to, to transfer this uh, human ability to, to computer systems. Uh, so uh, with that said, uh, if we're talking about AI, it would, uh, it would probably, it would more be of uh, an art of making computer systems intelligent, uh, which means uh, making systems able to acquire and apply uh, these skills, of course, the skills that require the, the knowledge and the skills. So when you talk about data science, uh, again, data science uh, in, uh, in relation to AI and machine learning, uh, data science more deals with uh, understanding uh, the data, which means that uh, uh, it starts with uh, you know, getting the data, gathering the data, but then extracting information or, or extracting the knowledge from the data. And machine learning comes to, to bridge uh, specifically the, the gap uh, between data science and AI to be somewhere in between because uh, once you, you've extracted, extracted the knowledge from the data and you want to make uh, uh, machines able to, to, up, to acquire and, and apply skills using the data, you do that with machine learning by uh, getting the machines to learn some patterns or uh, uh, learn something that uh, they can use uh, to become intelligent. All right, thank you. That was a, a brief uh, definition of AI, artificial intelligence, data science, and machine learning. And uh, it was really brief because I know many people uh, joining us today, some of them may really love that you touched on the clear brief of AI. Thank you, Odas. Thank you. So uh, what have been the industrial applications of AI based on your work and experience? Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, perhaps what I'm working on right now, which uh, you also touched on about. Uh, but uh, I'm founder and CTO of Insidey, which is a random startup uh, that is, uh, whose mission is to bridge the gap in access to medical imaging services. So when we started, we were really uh, working on uh, a, te a teleradiology solution uh, to say, can we make uh, medical imaging uh, uh, services uh, accessible? And one of the issues, of course, we have in Rwanda is uh, that uh, uh, we don't really have a huge number of medical imaging uh, specialists or radiologists. And in comparison, uh, if you look in the US, uh, you'll see that uh, the US has, for example, 100 radiologists for uh, every million of the population. And in Rwanda, we still at uh, less than one radiologist per million. So you look at the gap and it's pretty much hundreds to one when you're comparing uh, the US to Rwanda. And uh, uh, 
uh, it's the same pattern you see in, in Africa. And really the, our biggest challenge was more of how do we make radiologists accessible in Africa uh, or in Rwanda specifically, uh, which meant that we are working on a solution to say uh, if a, a remote hospital needs uh, a CT scan or X-ray uh, interpreted instead of uh, waiting for two weeks, so let's make uh, people wait only for two hours. And that's really what we, we, we we're still aiming for, but the AI comes in, uh, started coming in when we realized that uh, it's still going to take a long time because uh, you, uh, you don't have enough people to really uh, serve everyone. And uh, we use AI specifically, uh, uh, specifically machine learning. I, I, I want to be specific here. We use machine learning and deep learning on, on uh, seeing if we can actually uh, uh, some of the images we have, if you can be able to extract features that uh, correspond to different diseases. And uh, part of the work we've been done in machine learning specifically was on, on, on training algorithms on, on x-rays to learn uh, different kinds of anomalies. And we've uh, done some work, some experimental work on, on, on COVID as well. And uh, we think this can play a big role uh, the, uh, in different ways. And the first role, uh, at least with uh, the state of the art uh, today, although you can't uh, say overnight you develop an algorithm, you put it in a clinic, but uh, you can be able to actually learn your demographics and perhaps uh, get an idea of what uh, the prevalences of different diseases and, and be able to flag images that are likely to have issues. And although you can't use that for diagnosis, you could actually use that to bring uh, some images, some patients to, to radiologists' attention. And we think that that's an approach, for example, that can help uh, in improving clinical outcomes. Uh, if you say you had uh, an algorithm with 95% uh, accuracy in terms of cost uh, sensitivity and, and specificity, for example, uh, what you can do, although you, 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 even if you can't use that to diagnose a patient conclusively, you, uh, Assuming in a thousand patients, the algor uh, patients, the algorithm tells you you have a uh, hundred patients with a certain disease, you would actually have been able to uh, to find uh, at least ninety five of them ahead of time, which means you've prioritized their care. So that's uh, an example of one of the applications of AI that I, 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 I'm working on right now. And uh, part of the work I was doing uh, when I was in college, uh, uh, specifically uh, in research. Uh, involved in different things such as uh, applying AI on, on things like credit scoring and uh, th that's some of the work uh, that uh, as well that I think is going to be more critical going forward because uh, AI can actually help us assess risk and, and for example if you're a bank uh, uh, there are different applications of, of, of AI uh, that can be used in, in, in things like fintech. Uh, Thank you. We are happy to hear from the application that you are from your 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 application that you are already trying. So it was really nice and to see that uh, your startup is bringing all the solution to Rwanda. So thank you for all this this work. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so speaking of application, uh, are there in career opportunities uh, in AI available in Rwanda? So uh, I think, uh, again, that's a question that can be answered in, in different ways, but uh, I've definitely seen people uh, who work in, in AI fields. And, and of course, starting with, uh, with, with, with what we do at Insidive, uh, we have uh, one a specific uh, engineer who, who is a machine learning engineer, and I think uh, I think uh, part of his main role is, is bringing uh, AI into the products that we build. And of course, uh, uh, again, it can be uh, phrased in different ways, but uh, a lot of us have probably heard of or have friends who work as data scientists or who are software engineers, but who really spend a lot of time working on, on data science or machine learning. Uh, I've also... Uh, seen people trying uh, artificial, uh, more artificial general intelligence tasks that, that are a little bit outside uh, of machine learning. So I think there is definitely uh, in different industries in Rwanda, specifically in the last uh, three to five years, you've seen people uh, working on machine learning and, and data science fields. And I think going forward, as we see more 
uh, startups and, and uh, big organizations adopting a use of AI in their products, I think that uh, we're going to be seeing more, uh, more career options specifically in Rwanda. Of course, in comparison, if you're comparing to, to North America, for example, uh, you know, the answer could be yes or no. Uh, the answer is more likely to lean towards a no because they are, uh, we shouldn't underestimate the gap that still is uh, in terms of uh, uh, the AI industry uh, maturing, like the, the way it's been in the US uh, for, for the last decade, for, for example. So I think uh, perhaps part of uh, why we're here is to see how uh, we can uh, perhaps uh, bridge the gap uh, in industry because AI is needed but yet we are not seeing uh, a lot of applications, although uh, it, it's really impressive to see some of the few uh, industries in Rwanda that are adopting it. Uh, thank you. It's also a good news for anyone joining us who is wondering if there might be career opportunities in AI. So you now hear that there are so many opportunities for AI enthusiasts in Rwanda. Uh, what computer language would you learn if you were starting out, if you were starting out in machine learning and other relevant tools along the way would you recommend to anyone who wants to join? Again, let me say that uh, that's a little bit of, of uh, there is an easy answer to that, but I think I, I want to, to, to lean towards the hard answer to say, uh, I'm not sure or it doesn't matter because uh, for example, if you're just starting uh, and you're a student, uh, I, I believe that the, it's actually more important, I would say, to start with learning how to code because uh, I've heard stories or, or some of the memes I've seen is, is more of people trying to, coming to computer science just to do AI and, and, and skipping everything to, uh, to work on, on machine learning. But, but I believe that, uh, if you're just starting out with computer science, perhaps uh, learning how to code, it could be in Python, for example, which is uh, what most people will end up using uh, in machine learning specifically. But uh, it could also be uh, any other language. For example, today, uh, there are actually some JavaScript uh, libraries that actually make it easy to build a very simple neural network and, and to train uh, on data. So I, I think that, for example, Python and JavaScript are definitely some of the tools that one can start with, but uh, I still believe that uh, even starting with C or C++ to learn how to code uh, over time, uh, once you're a good engineer, I believe that you're actually more prepared to, to work with, uh, to handle the complexity of machine learning if the goal is to apply it in industry. Uh, I like that you, you touched on building long-term success by learning the basic first before you such tools so it's really it's really account for the long-term success uh, uh considering to to learn the basics to build the coding skills and understanding skills i would agree to that too thank you thank you uh how does the hiring process look like for machine learning engineer data science and data engineering law. And what best advice would you give to the audience on data science transition, talent preparation and hiring? You know, I would say, at least from my experience, it hasn't be, been so different from the normal uh, engineering uh, hiring process. Of course, uh, when you're going to be a data science specifically, uh, for example, in a, a technical interview, usually has uh, a coding question. So as a data scientist, uh, it's very likely that, of course, the question will, about, will be more leaning towards uh, a question that asks uh, ask a little bit about data science. But uh, from my experience, it, it, part of it, of course, has been more uh, ha has been more on the written side, but uh, as, as in uh, more mathematical problems, there are some uh, uh, sometimes where they ask mathematical problems, but most of the time it's going to be more of a coding problem that just requires you to think like a data scientist. Again, I think uh, I'm assuming that most uh, recruiters or, or most of the time, not recruiters, but interviewers will be wanting to know more about uh, the thinking rather than the direct uh, application. Because uh, if you have a good engineer, you, you can actually 
uh, if you have a good engineer, engineer who is also good at math, you can make them into a good data scientist. So I, at least from my experience, it's been more of uh, mostly engineering, but uh, of course, looking for some uh, thinking uh, as a data scientist. But I've also seen some roles that uh, purely will ask you for some specific, uh, st uh, uh, specific things about statistics, although those are uh, very unlikely given that most of the time, even when you're hired as a data scientist, you may actually spend uh, like 80% of your time doing things that are a little bit outside of data science. So I think that it's not so different from the normal engineering recruiting process, except uh, if you can demonstrate uh, the application of data science in the way you answer questions. I, I think that, that that is definitely something that makes one uh, one, one, sta one standout. Of course, in terms of uh, transition uh, slash uh, preparation, uh, I think that uh, definitely familiarity with, the, I think I've seen uh, courses, for example, online that uh, are introduction to data science. Of course, uh, it gets more complex from that. But I think uh, if you're an engineer who is familiar with building systems, but you want to transition to data science, I think that uh, some preparation in terms of taking the one ones of data science machine learning is the, the first step. Uh, thank you for your advice on anyone who would like to transition to data science or machine learning. And uh, thank you for, for your time on this response. It was really happy to hear from you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so now we get to here from our next speaker, he's Desile, Desile Machine Learning Practitioner. We welcome you to your session. Uh, thank you, Uh All right, so let's start with uh, the first question. Uh, uh, Desiree, what are the myths around AI? Uh, are there any misconception and how do we overcome them? Hey Des, uh, are you able to join in or to be able to respond to the question maybe? Yes, I've been talking actually for the last couple of minutes uh, with the mute. I'm sorry for that. Um, so I was saying yes, um, about the myth around AI. There are actually a series, but I will start with those that I do care the most which are specifically, uh, let's start with neural networks are like biological, ne biological networks, uh, neurons. Um, I think it's not completely true because the human brain is a complex system and the way the neural networks, the artificial neural networks are transmitting the information from one to another is by applying some activation functions that are trying to mimic the way the information is transmitted between the biological neurons. But this is as far as the comparison can go. Um, that's why when we say that neural networks are simil working similarly to the biological neural networks, it's not completely wrong, but it is oversimplifying the context. Then there is another comparison, I mean, another myth that I like pretty much. That is um, when we say that we are getting close to the artificial general intelligence. Fact is that we are far away from it. Many people have heard about the singularity. Uh, just to remind what it is, it is when we talk about the technological singularity, uh, theoretically a point in time 
where the technology would have evolved so much and at such a scale that it will become uncontrollable. And we know very popular movies that came out of that myth, specifically Terminator and so on. And this is not to confuse with the physical singularity, which in the context of a black hole is a one dimensional point in space that has such a huge mass that its density and the mass are almost infinite. We've seen in movies like Stellar, the event horizon of a black hole, which is its limit, and beyond the event horizon comes the singular point. So these two concepts are very different in their application, but they've been used in sci-fi to talk about the singularity and the super intelligence and so on. Let me put things clear. As someone mentioned on Twitter a while back, if it's written in Python, it's machine learning. But if it's written in PowerPoint, it is AI. Let's not be afraid of what AI has to bring, but let's not be blind either of the risk that will come with it. What I mean with that is that, as we say, with big powers come big responsibilities. There will be jobs that will be disrupted, and we'll probably talk about that later on. But there will be also a lot of jobs that will be created. And this is what personally I'm focusing on. How do we prepare the current and the next generation in upscaling their skills, in getting ready to jump on the new wave of jobs that will come from these technologies already widely adopted by most of us, but also the next generation to come. Another myth that I like is when we say that the data to build strong um, model, machine learning model, you need a huge data set, which is true in many ways. That's how uh, terms like big data and so on came into place. But it also means underlined that only big companies, specifically the four to five bigger tech companies in the world at the moment, have access to this data set. My personal belief, and that has been actually shown by uh, fact uh, through startups, is that it's not about the algorithm, but it's about the data, specifically the good data. If you have data from a niche market with a specific use that is good enough to provide the best quality and the best accuracy in terms of service, then it doesn't matter how big is your data sets, or it doesn't matter how big are the competitors, because you're simply the master in your small territory. Companies like IM, which is a photo sharing application company, or um, also another company that has been uh, bought by Google actually a while back, which is called um, Waze. Um, you have now also, of course, companies like TikTok, Snapchat. They are all experts and masters in their own realm. And they are proving that you don't need to be a giant technological company to have a very good machine learning system. But it takes a niche market and it takes mastery to get to that point. Last but not least, another myth that I like is um, AI is a black box. There is a certain level of black boxness, if I can say this way, uh, within AI, uh, but it's actually mostly related to the inner working of the neural network. However, thanks to a new wave of uh, demand from the users, the people, about explaining the algorithm, about putting the lights onto it, we have now a new trend of what we call responsible AI or fair AI, ethical AI, explanatory AI that requires from the engineers and the developers to not only build an algorithm that works, but to also bring along the information that will allow other researchers, engineers, or simply citizens to reverse engineer the product and to show how the inner working of the system has been put together. Uh, you have things like um, uh, machine learning uh, model cards or data cards. You have also requirements to have not only big data, but actually be good quality data. You have the requirement for more representative representativity within your data sets so that your machine learning system will not only work 
for the minority that has shared their data to build and train the system, but also for the simply big majority of all of us who are diverse with different languages and different skin tones and so on. So these are some of the myths that I wanted to highlight here. Uh, thank you, Desiree. I know you like to talk about myths around AI and I like that you you make it very clear, like for anyone following us, AI isn't a black box, like good model comes from good data. Thank you for talking about that. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, in your opinion, which corporate departments will probably be the most impacted by artificial intelligence, uh, marketing, customer service, accounting and finance, production, sales, help and agriculture? My personal opinion, but that is also backed by some research over the past few years that are available on, uh, online, is that, <clears throat> of course, the service jobs are going to be mostly hit by um, intelligent systems. They are actually already hit. Uh, and you can take the example of this pandemic, for example, that we are living in. We've got the rise of applications like Zoom that we are doing this call on. And um, the technological companies that I mentioned earlier have all, to some extent, had their um, grab on, the, on our society increased for very good reasons. And they are making our life easier. But they are also automating a whole spectrum of jobs that were thought to be, until now, safe from automation. I would put them into three to four categories. Customer service that I mentioned. Typically now, when you call um, a company or an organization, you don't interact anymore, at least very rarely, in developed countries with uh, someone working in the call center. You can very seamlessly interact with a chatbot that will um, basically interact, answer in the more efficient and straightforward way that a human would, not to undervalue the competencies of a human working call center, but simply to um, remove the burden of repetitive tasks and helping in sorting the request of the customers and sending them to the right department. The way I would see it happening is that instead of having chatbot, robot replacing customer service staff, it will be embedded within the customer service department while the staff will be upskilled, taught new practices on how to interact with the chatbot and making the whole process streamlined so that you don't end up having huge job losses on one end, but instead you have actually staff that are using the technology to make their job easier, faster, and better. You have another category that um, is the banking, finance, and accounting sector. This is the wave that we've seen for the past years, almost decade, where whole departments have been digitalized, automated, and department that at some point used to have, I don't know, thousands of employees now end up having maybe 10, uh, 100 employees maximum, because computers are very good at doing things that we are not good at, which are repetitive tasks, um, numbers, calculation, automation. However, we're still, as human, uh, custodians of creativity, empathy, um, storytelling, imagination. And if I, there is any advice that I would give to people is, it's great to all go to engineering and technology and science and so on. I myself, I'm an engineer and physicist, but I would encourage even more the future generation to maybe look deeper into human sciences um, and any f profession or studies that involves uh, care, empathy, and emotions, because I believe that these are areas where it will take a long time for artificial intelligence and robots to be better at us, uh, better than us in this. Another, uh, the last two uh, clusters that I would put out here are programming jobs. 
so developers basically and i do also a bit of development but i gotta say that we all as developers today when we have a problem we spend a lot of time on stack overflow which is like the the platform of choice when you don't know how to code this and that and we all have a github account and we all have um, a devops tool chain to automate our processes well uh a computer, a machine learning algorithm program can actually do this job better than us. Subjecting, there is a component of natural language processing, uh, processing that is embedded into it. We've heard also, as enthusiasts of AI, about the latest GPT-3, which is just amazingly smart when it comes to speaking and writing almost like a human. It's still a machine, but it does so many things that I'm quite impressed. It's still also very biased and sexist, but that's another problem. But when it comes to delivering, I see a future where um, website and the programs will be actually written by machine learning uh, based algorithm trained to build machine learning algorithm. And to finish, um, transport. We know about big transport companies, um, well, Uber and uh, Tesla and so on, and all the um, autonomous driving. This is the future. It's not really about if it's going to happen, it's about when. And uh, truck drivers are going to sadly be impacted. Uh, taxi drivers are already impacted. So we can do one thing. We can either decide to not adopt it and refuse the technological advances, but then it will just postpone what eventually will happen. Or we can try to learn to implement these technologies. And again, to go back to my motto, of scaling the people, training them, getting them ready for whatever is to come. Because it's already there. It's not really about when, uh, if, but it's about when it's going to happen. Thank you for for your opinions on these categories and how AI will impact each one of these categories. Uh, so what is the most exciting niche in the machine learning or deep learning space? I would say my personal choice well but again that is backed by trends and uh, research is machine vision so computer vision image recognition and uh, nlp natural language processing <clears throat> for two reasons um, the technology today is mature enough to process what used to be very resource hungry so images uh, sound videos and um, for the natural language processing part it is in my opinion the last realm that remains quite uh, raw and untouched by most technological companies apart from of course the big ones imagine in our african continents we have 54 plus language i mean no we have actually hundreds of languages if you include the dialect and most of these languages are currently not really available on the main platforms of translations. So imagine if tomorrow you build data sets that are ready to be implemented by these algorithms. And on top of that, you build product intelligence that will allow people who currently have no other choice but using English speaking application to interact with each other you're going to empower and enable uh, most African people to communicate in their language to these applications and benefit from the services that currently are limited to only those who do speak widely spread developed countries' languages, which is great, but there is such an untapped opportunity that I hope I and colleagues, partners, citizens of the African continents or whoever is speaking a language that is currently forgotten will contribute to, 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 to enable within these applications. Um, I've been interacting with startups that are actually working on these sectors. There is, for example, one that implement um, image recognition to monitor the traffic 
in the street of Kigali to avoid, of course, the speed uh, excess and therefore fines that would occur. They also can use their software to um, count the number of people waiting at the bus stop so that the bus coming will actually be able to adjust its route based on the loads of the customers and so on. I've seen you know, European, American, Chinese companies doing it abroad, but no one can imagine that this is already available in our countries. And this is the light that I'm trying to put out there. There is a capacity here, but what might be lacking at the moment is the communication channel that will allow these applications that are local and specific to be then available to a wider uh, customer group. You can also use image recognition in medical intake, uh, assisting in um, taking your medicine at a specific time by simply taking photo of this medicine and ensuring that over time your historical, uh, your history use will be picked up and then it will automatically send your reminder over time. Uh, these technologies can also be used in a growing industry that we very too often overlook uh, when you think of the African continent, but I'm personally very interested in it. It's actually the space industry. Okay, I'm a physicist, but I'm not talking about the physics uh, style uh, SpaceX, but I'm talking about the physics on the image recognition capability that will allow farmers right. and agriculture to process, uh, to have intelligence from their land and accordingly take decisions on how or when to harvest, how much is the crops rate, and so on. Uh, thank you, Desley. Two exciting niche, computer vision and natural language processing. I am personally fascinated by computer vision, like how a machine can see and, and process. Thank you for touching on this, on this specific. Uh, our next question, uh, how would you build data privacy sensitive uh, AI product or system, if any? Um, first of all, I guess uh, it will be important to mention why it matters to have data privacy sensitive application. I often, until now, when I talk about data privacy with partners, friends, or even professionals, the usual answer is, why would I care about it? I have nothing to hide. But uh, recently, I saw a very interesting post from uh, Edward Snowden. OK, it might be a controversial figure to mention here, but the fact is that what he said is talking about you have nothing to hide when we mention the data privacy aspect is like saying, I don't care about freedom of speech because I have nothing to say. What I mean by that is that we um, need to make the personal data of the users and citizen uh, processed in a way that is responsible and allow both parties, the um, implementers of this data and the provider, which are us, to have a certain level of control on it. Uh, European Union, uh, has been working actually quite a lot on this topic and came up a few years ago with the GDPR, which I believe is a great step in the right direction for most of us to follow because it made us realize that our data have value. And even though we are very happy to use all these free services that makes our life so easy, it will be fair and uh, responsible for us to have either the possibility to opt out from sharing our data or at least to get certain fee by the use of this data. And then it's up to the companies using our data to decide which business model to adopt. But to put it simple, me as a customer or user, however, we don't want to slow down the progress, of course, because many technology core implementers will say, if you limit the access of data, then it's way of slowing the process that the technological advances down and it becomes geopolitical and so on. So I won't get into details here, but it is important to have data privacy sensitive application that allows consumers to opt out, the AI system to be easily understood and explained, and the data can be deleted upon request at any time. We have already AI systems that, allow, that are already applied in cybersecurity, typically to detect uh, malware and ransomware. 
um, you have also, and we don't even realize it anymore because it's so ubiquitous, but our spam filtering in our mailbox is implementing machine learning algorithm to detect whether or not this email that comes to the mailbox is, is legitimate, authentic, or is just a fake trying to get some money out of you. Um, we have also AI applied in protecting privacy by classifying the data, as I mentioned with the example of spam, filtering, and also managing sensitive data. So long story short, it's not really talking about the future in building data privacy sensitive application, but it's more about scaling it up to the level where even those who don't care much of the data privacy will be offered data privacy sensitive application by default. And then it will be up to them to either opt out from it or to continue with it. And my personal preference, uh, the sweet spot, I would say, is combination of artificial intelligence and distributed ledger technology, aka blockchain. Because of very simple reason, you combine this with both the security enabled feature embedded within the blockchain by design and the smart service that allow that are enabled by the use of machine learning or deep learning systems. A very, very easy example is currently um, what we could call the AI DAO. A DAO is actually a distributed autonomous organization, meaning an organization that works in a trustless manner and that doesn't require a third party or middleman to enable to allow or not the transaction between the parties. When you combine this with the power of artificial intelligence, you end up having an organization that can work in an intelligent manner autonomously, like let's say um, art painting auction. The gun will then make the drawing, the board, the painting, and through the DAO, will then put it on the market, decide on the price based on the current uh, shares, and automatically sell it to the best offering. And this can be an everlasting process. So these are the different ways I believe we could end up having actual relevant application of this uh, privacy requirement within real life use. Uh, thank you very much for talking about uh, AI ethics, data privacy, and it was really great to hear from you, Desiree. My pleasure. Thank you. Oh. Uh, we now go to our third speaker, our last speaker, David Praise, David Praise Data Analyst at Three Lights. Welcome once again. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, thank you. Uh, Desley, uh, sorry, David, uh, in your professional work, can you give one concrete example of applying AI? data science or machine learning to an enterprise and how it's worked? Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a very good question. So currently I work for 3 Light, which falls under the construction sector. And I will shock you by saying the construction industry is lagging compared to many other industries in language and big data. And currently, it is interesting today to work in data analytics and artificial intelligence because not a lot of advancement has been made as compared to other industries like the autonomous industry, yet the construction industry is not like that. And what prevents the advance of big data is the data is siloed. And still today, most of the data is siloed meaning the information is cumulative and structure, which are not easy to integrate together. And this is because applications are designed to serve a particular needs or function. So let's say we could have like a software for planning, a software for cost estimation, for printing, managing people, client relationship management, all these different types of softwares. And so these softwares evolved over the years, serving a particular function, preventing integration together. 
and so combination is good. So um, what we are working on at 3Light is, is the integration of unstructured data with a lot of text generated and manually input text. So here you have like much papers, uh, much papers are created. So there's so much noise coming from reports, meetings, emails, and text analysis is at the core of what we do. So using natural language processing, NLP, to segregate data and make it available for someone who wants to use it. Another uh, like uh, point is like, our AI assistants at construction sites. So pretty much you've seen applications whereby you have um, a camera that monitors the laborers at the construction site. And if they're not with the helmets on, then you could easily flag it and report it to the system. And what we do also, another application of what we do with uh, text analysis is creating information dashboards. So here we want to like process information and prepare dashboards. So users have hourly dashboards as compared to like weekly dashboards. Another issue like also um, in the construction industry is generational issues. So newer generations as opposed to old generations, the older ones are still driving the construction industry. So leveraging data, it's all like manual inputs. So here we have like all those forms are either filled manually and there is like no automatic shared data. And the way that the younger generations expect things to move forward is different. So the younger ones are not satisfied with the thing, the way things are moving forward. So you have like, you usually have like manual hard work and there is no any like recent advancement. And the use of AI is to retain the talents of younger generations. So let's say for example, out of 100, over five of them have exploited and gone somewhere else because uh, it's still behind. So in order to like keep the top five smart working people by bringing the, con it's by bringing the construction industry up to standard. And if, um, if you also look back, like, um, so basically there have been like a slow technological advancement and which has uh, advancement in the last hundred years, which has definitely impacted the construction industry negatively. If you also look back to the Empire, the Empire State Building in New York, where like, there was no internet, no cell phones, emails, only like radio communications, and that building took only 13 months to, to develop. And now, in order to construct such a building, it could take almost two to three years. And so we can see like, you know, definitely this is not good and something must be done. And so most of the construction data, they definitely do look backwards to see what went wrong. So analyzing historical data, so you want to check like, okay, how do we manage? How do we look forward? How do we anticipate risk? How do we predict certain events? And how do we definitely improve construction sites? And I will round up by saying artificial intelligence in the construction industry is primarily developing the availability to leverage all this heterogeneous information to solve problems and make the right decisions to also retain talents of the younger generations. Thank you. Thank you, David. Very great to hear AI in construction. Yes, it is. Uh, you know, people have different opinions, and in your opinion, which corporate department will be probably the most impacted by AI, either marketing, customer service, accounting and finance, production and set? production, sales, how funds, agriculture? And from my own experience, like from my own, of what I've, basically what I've read from research papers and other different, I've looked into different areas, I would say definitely all these industries will definitely be impacted by artificial intelligence in one way or the other. So 
I wouldn't say like definitely the health industry definitely is going to be the most impacted. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you for your opinion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know, AI is almost changing everything, so no doubt that yes. everything will be impacted. Oh, uh, what advice would you give to people looking to transition in artificial intelligence, data science, and machine learning? Okay, so basically, I'll give you three points. So my first point is to start learning right now. Like it doesn't matter if you're older or younger, you know, there is absolutely nothing like being too older or too young. Because uh, as long as you have breath, it's never too late. It's only when you're dead, that's when it's too late. My second point is spend some time to practice, even if it's at least for 20 hours in a week. And if you're a kind of person who is like wholly occupied with other priorities, with kids and other things, I would say even at least only 30 minutes a day would definitely impact your life in a positive way. So if you spend like 30 minutes in a day, in a week that sums up to 3.5 hours, and in a month that's 14 hours in a month, and in a year that's around 168 hours. And my third advice is to read technical blog posts out there. Like take a book, read it, and take online courses. And once you start them, you shouldn't like stop halfway and jump into another online course because someone else said this is better than that. But you, when you, once you start something, you should finish it. You should go all the way to the end. And if you're stuck out there, that's when you could definitely refer to technical blog tutorials out there. And there are also, if you have some issues with code or with, like, if you get an error that you're not quite sure about, there is someone out there who has definitely encountered that kind of error. So, and there is also a massive community of developers available online. So you could spend some time on Stack Overflow on GitHub and other different uh, platforms. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That is a very practical advice for anyone who would like to make transition. So 30 minutes a day with Vinaya, you can really have learned a lot. So yes. Start today. Two little steps, they count. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a small note to our audience, if you have question, I have seen many questions in the comments, but if you still have questions, please drop it in the comments so that our speaker will, will respond to it. And if you know a friend who is who you, who you think would like to follow this event, copy the link and share it, even if we have a few minutes, but they could still benefit from the rest of the event. Yeah, sure, so Oh, uh, this is the time for for the like full panelists, our three speakers giving their talk on on one question. So I will ask the same question to all of them, and this is the time that we get to hear the very practical advice of breaking into AI, breaking into data science, breaking into machine learning. So I will start with Odas and Desiree will follow and then we'll also close with David. So what actionable plans, tactics and strategies would you share with the audience on how to advance and excel in this highly dynamic and evolving data world while building strong and impressive portfolios? Welcome Odas. Thanks once again. And, uh, this is a very good question because I, I, again, I think part of the what the speakers have said uh, has, has a little bit touched on that, on this. Uh, you know, but I'd like to say that uh, at least from my experience, I think that there is always it, it always seems like there is a lot of things one could do in terms of plans and activities and strategies. But uh, what I what I found more useful is more kind of being, being problem oriented as, as opposed to just trying out everything. I, I realized that I'm more productive when I, I know specifically the reason behind doing something. For example, 
if I should pick one data science course, for example, versus the other. To me, it's always been about what do I want to do in that. And uh, I think now going from the, the specifics to the more kind of how do you uh, make sure that you advance and, and excel, again, I think that uh, most of it is, is basically knowing what's going on uh, and then seeing how you can be part of it. Because, uh, for example, this, uh, this decade, uh, like from 2015 to 2025, everybody is talking about AI. And it's why we are here. So I think the best time to learn about AI is today. But uh, if, if you're thinking 10 years from now, uh, some, there's, there may be something else. So I have a feeling that I definitely uh, think on the lookout for what's going on and, and being part of it has definitely uh, been one of the things that I think are, are very useful because uh, there, I, I feel like there'll be a time when, uh, you know, we won't be able to solve all the AI problems, but there may be a time when uh, AI is not as interesting as today. So uh, that's definitely what I would suggest. All right. Thank you for your plans and tactics and, and strategies on this question. Now let's welcome this day. Yes. Um, I would say less is more, meaning start simple first. Um, don't try to build a tower within a day. It's just not going to work. Start with the basic, the foundation. Start by making sure that you know basics or you learn, you teach yourself the basics of uh, web developments or at least basic programming. Today, most people would head towards Python and or JavaScript because these are simply the two languages that have the biggest communities and on which most of the applications we're interacting today are built. But let's not forget, of course, the backend side. C, C++ are still, is still the language that is the backbone of all of our IT industry. Then I would also recommend to add to this, if you don't already have it, um, basic to moderate math knowledge because if you want to know things in depth you will need math specifically calculus algebra if you want to learn and know about it in surface like i did when i started uh, my machine learning and deep learning journey a few years back then you might not need it though in my case uh, that was part of my education so i was actually better in the math part than the programming part I had to do things the other way around. I actually had to teach myself the basic of programming to be able to turn into computer language what I already knew in human language, mathematical language. But long story short, the combination of both is important and critical. To be good at what you do, to be able to answer from simple to in-depth questions, to understand the why you're doing something, not just the what and the how, but really the why, because it's not really about what you build at the end of the day, it's more about why you're doing it. Who is the end user? Is it just for your own sake to have a big portfolio that you can present in an interview? Or is it for an actual use outside of your computer and your GitHub repo that can be leveraged by random users, challenged <clears throat> questions and improved by the community? That's also another recommendation that I will give, which is collaborate to projects, open source specifically. I'm a big fan of open source and advocate for it because most of the products we're using today are actually the result of open source projects. And I would highly recommend anyone who would like to get their hands on machine learning and deep learning to find a problem that they are interested in and might already have a solution or might not have a solution and to decide to build something around this. Work on project, learn the skills that are specific to this project, whether they are on the web development part, front end, back end, UI, UX and so on, or in the context of our talk, the machine learning bits, learn the algorithm that are specific to the use if it's a video recommender you want to build, then learn about 
um, KNN algorithm about Bayesian uh, method and about whatever that is related to it, if you want. Or maybe you can do also as I did some years ago, which is finding a uh, computing uh, power resource that is either coming from Azure, Google Cloud, Amazon Web Services, or whatever else, you name it, and learn just to use their API, build the application around this, and then moving on when your startup or your project will get more traction, <clears throat> either yourself or your research engineer will then dive in reverse engineering, break it down to its component and understanding why is my artificial neural network coming up with this result instead of that one and understanding all the mechanics behind so that when you'll be asked to explain the algorithm, you will have all the key infos available at hand. Uh, my last recommendation will be don't be afraid to jump on board because even though at the moment the best minds who are behind and applying artificial intelligence are also at the same time some of the brightest minds on earth and just for a purely um, I would say material interest the trends in terms of salaries and job opportunities for anyone with data analysis skills are increasing at scale but keep in mind that they also aim to be automated at some point but i would say you don't need to be a genius to do it if you are a smart a street smart in the way you do things find a problem learn just the skills that are needed for this specific problem at the tea time build something that works then scale up if it's another problem you want to solve, or if it's just about adding new features or new sources to your application, and then learn again the skills that are related to it and so on. And that's how, with an iterative loop, you end up having built yourself a set of skills that is wide and strong enough to be confident when you talk about data analysis and machine learning and so on. But also, along the way, you would have built quite an interesting portfolio that you can display to anyone, including recruiters and employers. Uh, thank you, thank you, Desley. That's very practical tactics to transition into AI, to learn AI. So start simple, find problems, collaborate, uh, and yeah, and that's very practical. Thank you for, for all these tactics. Now we go to, to David. All right. So, well, as my other panelists has mentioned, panelists have mentioned, well, you should also take their advice and just to touch a bit on what they've mentioned, like uh, some advice I'll give to you is like once you get a problem, you uh, deconstruct the problem, like you take it and you break it down into bits and pieces and try to solve them like that. Like you should, once you get a problem, you shouldn't just like jump straight into it, you know should break it down and uh, tackle the problem. Another point is to like, you should learn to self correct yourself, okay? So let's say you wanna start your career right now. So you like, uh, you could say like, okay, definitely I wanna read like 20 books, you know, I wanna finish like 10 books related to Python, you know, to get started on how to start programming. And once you realize that you've Sometimes you could like go for a bit, then you realize that you just lose motivation and you just like, you know, stop learning. I would say like, you should like, you should um, learn just enough to start like practicing and implementing, not until like you complete it. And finally, to remove barriers to, to practice, such as like distractions like social medias and television. So when it's time to practice, just cut off every form of distraction and focus to learn something before you go back to what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. And I would like to thank you all for your thoughts on, on this question. So I'm very positive that by now our audience, they have a clear, clear plan on how they can learn AI. Start simple, find problem, and then break it down. Uh, this is the time to 
answer some of the question which was asked in the comments. Uh, we start with uh, with the first one. So uh, uh, it says, I would like to ask which one can you choose as career between machine learning and AI, or you can go with both. Uh, or that's may you help us with this question? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so I think this is an interesting question because, uh, like you said, uh, you know, it's not clear how, how much of, of, of machine learning belongs slash doesn't belong into in AI because when you talk about AI, we look at machine learning as one of the, uh, the subcategories. But uh, in terms of uh, career-wise, I think that uh, today almost every AI engineer, I think more than 95% of AI engineers are actually doing uh, something about machine learning or, or deep learning. Uh, so I, I think that uh, in terms of practice, there's definitely a lot of work and opportunity available in machine learning. And of course, that's because some of most of the technical problems in machine learning have been addressed, but uh, if you're looking at AI, I think there's a long way to go in terms of saying how, when can we bring, uh, can we build artificial general intelligence and when can we bring it to industry to actually make it uh, solve problems uh, that uh, basically make it, uh, use it to, to bring solutions to things, things that the market needs. But I think if you're looking at the markets, there's a really higher demand for things related to machine learning and, and data science and, and deep learning. And I think that career-wise, career -wise, that's what I would, I would go for. But with that said, uh, a machine learning engineer is an AI uh, practitioner. So I, I want to make that clear. In terms of why choose one, not the other, I think uh, when you choose machine learning, you practice in AI. Of course, you can go back to that in the machine learning to be considered one of the subcategories of AI. Uh, thank you, Das, for answering this question. Uh, the next question will go to Desile. I will read it. Uh, many African countries have a problem with data sets. How long does it take for data scientists to reach goals? How do you overcome those barriers? Um, I will take the example of a journey of a startups that I've been in touch with and I try that my best to help them. Um, they are trying to build their set of uh, Kenya Rwanda language and the journey has started more than a year ago. So just to give you an idea, it is a long process because we, we don't start from scratch for most African languages unless they are very rarely spoken in the community that speaks it. But the first place to go if you'll be looking for data sets is checking if there is something that already exists. So typically uh, Google Translator, obviously, but they don't open source their data sets because as you can imagine, data is gold. So if you get the gold, well, you make it free to everyone. But then you dive deeper and you look into academic data sets. Is it available or not? If not, because I prefer building on top of what already exists and improving it than starting something from scratch if the goal is ultimately to make a product out of it. So if after your search you don't find any existing start to build something upon, then you have to collect this data manually if you have the resources in terms of human collect it, you know, registering it, either uh, vocally or by text or by, um, well, video is like the last steps because it's heavier and more difficult to process. But I would say, start with text data. If you just want a data set of words, uh, you can leverage on social media that often uh, help, allows you to connect to their API endpoints and basically fetching some of this data as long as you're reasonable and building over time your, um, your startup data sets. Uh, then if you want the vocal data, then you need to use a little bit more sophisticated technologies like a recorder. It's more hectic, it's harder because you have to you know, find ways to incentivize people 
to talk to you and let you record their data. You have an initiative that is very interesting from Mozilla that allows that. You have other companies that also do it. <clears throat> but remember, those who will have the data set will have the power to then build product upon it that will be used by billions of people. Specifically, when we know that the African population is aiming at doubling by 2050. So it's up to us to build these data sets. It's difficult. It takes time, it takes resources. But if you are lucky enough to have public organizations and authorities that are backing up your initiative, and you have also the chance to have technological companies and implementers that are providing the computing resources to process this data, and you have a team of driven, motivated tech people, but also entrepreneurs from different backgrounds. Uh, natural language processing that I mentioned earlier is heavily relying on the hard work of linguists, people who manually translated words from the local language to international languages and give the meaning to these words. Because once you've collected this data from whatever way you want, you still need to translate them in the language that is already available out there through AI services. And you need also to do some complex machine learning tasks like tokenization, memeization, and so on, but I won't get down into details, that will allow you to start from a series of basic phrases, and then you break it down in pieces, you take these words or pieces of words, and then you can reassemble them in new phrases that your application will be able to interpret. It's a long process, but it's feasible. My personal experience is that you need to have some organization to back you up on both the private and the public sides. And you need to have also a strategy built up that will allow you that even when you start losing motivation, you still keep on going because there is a lot of potential in every project in the future. And I can very, very much see that those who will build the most and biggest and best quality um, African languages data set in the future would actually be those who would have the edge for this AI product to come. So this is my experience and uh, my suggestion now to fix it. Uh, that was a great question and I hope it is answered very well and clearly. Uh, the next question um, says, uh, if one is already a software engineer and want to jump into machine learning, what do you suggest as next step to take? Uh, I would really like to have uh, Mr. David to talk on this question. Oh, okay, so that's a very interesting question. I would say from just like a little bit of experience, um, machine learning is like another tool to use like to solve problems as a software engineer. And if you want to get started your career, I recommend you take some online courses related to like, you know, linear algebra. So you, you should get familiar with vectors and matrices, eigenvectors, like eigenvalues, and take some a course on about optimization. So you should have like a bit of knowledge about basic calculus at least. You could, um, another advice is like you take a course related to statistics because that's also very important. Mm, you also have like mm, some online platforms like Kaggle, which you could check. So basically you could filter the search. You like, let's say there's a given problem that will just release. You, know, you could go through the notebook because a lot of you post different notebooks over there. Check out the most commented one and read on how people, you know, approach different problems in order to like build a very good idea on how to tackle different questions and that you face every single day. And that's what I'll recommend. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, the last question that we have is really interesting. Uh, I will have Desiree talk about it. It says, what goes on behind the scene in the robots like Sophia? What 
sorts of algorithms and data do they train with this robot to see that it can interact to human close to perfectly? <laughs> it's indeed uh, quite a fun question. Indeed. Uh, just to, to, to clarify, Sophia, is, she, is it the robot that we saw at um, uh, the African Tech Summit last year or something, just to clarify? Because yes, I know definitely. Siri, I know Alexa, but I'm not sure about Sophia. Yeah, definitely. Like, you know, Oh, the oh, that's, oh okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I mean, I, 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 I would reserve my personal opinion of what Sophia does or does not for myself, but I would say, put, simply put, instead of talking about Sophia, I would talk about those that I know a bit, which are Alexa, Siri, and so on. You train the robots. Um, I mean, Sophia is a robot. But behind the, the, the robot is kind of just the shell. What matters, what gives value to this robot, Sophia, is actually the intelligence or so-called intelligence that is behind. The way you train um, software to talk is by feeding it with some data, uh, just like a machine learning algorithm or deep learning algorithm that will, over time, being fine-tuned, uh, increase efficiency and accuracy to the point where at some point it will autonomously be able to formulate phrases without any supervision in the back in the back end if we're talking here about unsupervised learnings. Um, in the case of um, physical device like Sophia, you would have the software bits put in embedded within the hardware bits just to give some kind of human shape and human-like interaction with it, because it makes it just so nicer to talk with uh, someone who looks like us than a smartphone or a computer. But the result is the same. It's about interacting with the software trained with data that is in the back end. Uh, in the case of Sophia, uh, as I've understood, because there has been a little bit of controversy around this, I wouldn't personally call it artificial intelligence, or I would actually literally call it artificial intelligence, because it's not much machine learning and deep learning behind, but mostly a series of requests and queries that have been pre-programmed with a bit of um, supervised learning that add a more uh, seamless human flow to the communication. But if you're looking at um, proper artificial intelligence conversation, then I would direct you to more specific application uh, that you can already find in our smartphone with the voice assistant. And you already have some robots that are also interacting with you using uh, natural language um, processes. But remember, it doesn't really matter what is the hardware or the shape of the bot that will be used as a channel. It is, at this moment, just a channel. What matters is how do you build, train, and explain the software and the data that are have in the back end and allow that human-like interaction. That was a really interesting question. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you all for the audience on their question. They really asked a really great and interesting question. Uh, for this point, uh, we are getting to the end of our event. So it has been really great to have you all, to have our audience following us, to have our speakers. So the next, the next, the next thing to the thing to do is to close with the limits from every speaker, uh, maybe in one minute. Like I will start with, uh, with Odas, Desley, and David in that sequence. I'm sorry. Uh, so I would like to say thank you so much for having us and uh, for starting the initiative. To, to get to talk about AI, I think it's a, it's a great step in the right direction. 
And I would like to thank specifically, you know, the team that organized it and, and the audience as well. I think everybody who is here, uh, it's because they are interested in, in learning about AI or, or hearing about uh, thoughts from, from, from uh, different people, but also uh, uh, perhaps doing something in, in the AI field. So I think that uh, I'm very happy to see the community, the AI community in Rwanda growing, uh, which is amazing given that uh, we are already in a pandemic and, and uh, still we were able to, to, to get other things started. So I want to say thanks. And it's very encouraging definitely to, to see uh, th th this starting and I look forward to definitely being uh, seeing this grow and, and being engaged more in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Das. Um, I guess it's my turn. Uh, yes. I Yes, I thank uh, Pi and AI for the invitation. I really appreciate it. And I'm um, flattered and pleased to have been among the panel of such talented people as uh, Odas and David. And I believe that in the next rounds of meetups and webinars, we'll also invite um, some ladies active in the Rwandan uh, AI communities to join us simply because I've been lucky enough to see and meet some very talented ones and we need representation. We need to have people to relate to. And even though we are all Rwandans, Africans, and so on, uh, seeing other girls in this ecosystem will probably encourage even more others to join in and to demonstrate their talent. That is my first uh, uh, wish for the future. But beyond that, I'm really glad that there is such initiatives because uh, I've often um, explain and try to advocate for, we don't need a lot to build an AI community in the country that will be sustainable. We have the talents, I've met many of them. We lack the resources, but I'm confident it will come. And we lack the consistency. And this, I believe with the deep learning AI community will fit the purpose. I myself start learning machine uh, learning with Coursera classes and the first course of Andrew and G, which was about machine learning using MATLAB and Octave and focusing on maths. It was difficult, but I'm really pleased I started with these strong basics. So I'm inviting everyone to not being afraid and to just keep hacking, meaning break things, rebuild it, don't be afraid, and no mind can hire enough, we can do it. And it's just not some wishful thinking, but I've seen the talent out there. So I'm confident that with that community, there'll be more uh, made in Rwanda, made in Africa, AI software that'll come out in the near future that will be more specific, more relevant, and speaking languages that people can understand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Desiree. Uh, I'm positive that we'll get to have uh, ladies joining our community in next events, and it will be really cool to have them. Uh, now is the time for David. Oh, all right. So I would like to say thank you very much for inviting me to share my insights about applying AI in the construction industry. And I also like to thank the deep learning uh, AI uh, team and also the community. Thank you very much everyone for listening to us panelists for sharing our own insights. And our my main advice is like, you know, never stop learning, you know, never give up on your dream. Just keep moving, keep pushing. It's gonna be difficult. You're definitely gonna face a lot of obstacles, you know, but just keep pushing and in time, everything will be all right. And if you are definitely finding things difficult to learn or don't worry, okay, it's, it's a, like, it's, it's a process because once you keep going, you know, forward and forward, the way you see things or, or the way you approach different problems will definitely change. So just keep going and thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. David saying, keep moving, keep pushing. So 
Now we are getting to the end of our Best Buy and AI events in Kigari. Thank you very much for everyone who joined us. Also, big thanks to our speakers for the amazing talks. Uh, so like, so far now we really have what it takes to break into AI. I would like to also talk a bit about the Coursera courses that our audience will get to will get the coupons to to access the course. Within a few days, you will get an email from deepplanning.ai inviting you to access the course. So don't worry, you will have an access to the course very few days after the event. So thank you very much again. And until next time, please start learning.